Greetings and welcome to our webinar, Social and Territorial Inequality in Mexico and South Africa. My name is Susana Caputi. I will be your program director today. Thank you for taking the time to join in us today. I am Senior Research Associate at the Institute for Global Dialogue associated with the University of South Africa. This virtual round table explores the historical and contemporary socioeconomic perspectives of social and territorial inequality in Mexico and South Africa, which takes on multiple dimensions. The co-hosts will present their findings. A couple of house rules for everybody. The webinar recording will be available in YouTube to all to see at a later date uh, on the Institute for Global Dialogue YouTube channel. All microphones and video connections uh, will be uh, switched off to allow better connectivity. Uh, to hear the simultaneous translation from English to Spanish, uh, please press the interpretation button and choose English or, or, in Sp or Spanish. There will be a question and, a question and answer session. Uh, please drop your questions in the chat box. Uh, our main speakers uh, from Mexico are going to be Professor Humberto Gonzalez, and uh, who is the co-editor of, of the project uh, Global South Powers in Transition, a comparative analysis between Mexico and South Africa. Uh, Professor Dr. Miguel Reyes Hernandez unfortunately won't be able to attend. Uh, he has had an emergency and is out of the of the city of Mexico. And from South Africa, we are very honored uh, to have Professor Zita Mokomane, um, you know, defending the the the, the South African case. Uh, the respective bios uh, will be, sh be, be either shared by a message or on, on request. Uh, the value of to take uh, from this webinar, the value of this webinar is the comparative study between Mexico and South Africa, a binational project that offers interesting case studies on various topics. Today, we discuss the social and territorial inequality in both countries. Our speakers and moderator. Our moderator is Dr. Prishani Naidu, who is director of the Society Work and Politics Institute, um, called SWOP. Um, so I will basically, um, you know, just um, come in between um, everybody. And um, I will give the floor now to our ambassador of Mexico, um, Mrs. Uh, Sara Valdez. The floor is yours, ambassador. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Eh, thank you very much, Caputi, eh, Professor Caputi. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Welcome to this third uh, roundtable coordinated together, the Institute for Global Dialogue and UNISA in South Africa and the Mexican Embassy. The idea behind these roundtables has been to to provoke the reflection and the, in, the exchange of ideas between scholars, students, think tanks, and the, the general public about different subjects, topics, social, economical subjects that are particularly relevant for our both countries, Mexico and South Africa. Regarding this, the previous roundtables have been very inspiring in the, in the intention of, of updating the reflection and the debate 
el volumen titulado en español has, Potencias has started, Globales with the publication of the book comparativo the, the comparative Africa, analysis between Mexico and, and South Africa a very important uh, work that has been made by by academics and authors from both countries the two previous exercises that we have done the two previous roundtables have taken us to the update and to a conversation uh, about the subject of mining and in the first place and in the second place so about a uh, multicultural diversity i would like to thank uh, Dr. Pilani Zembu, Executive Director for the Institute for Global Dialogue and UNISA, and to his to his team, and also to to Susana Caputi, very um, because for 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 her to be with us in this reflection, and she as in her in her position of uh, associate researcher in the institute. And she has been very important to uh, to promote this this project. I would really want to to thank as well the co-editors, Dr. Humberto González and Professor Dion Heldenquist. Think is not going to be able to be with us today, and also to the authors of the two chapters of the, the chapter that we are going to be talking about today, uh, Dr. Sita Mukumane and uh, Dr. Graciela Teruel and Dr. Miguel Reyes. Last but not least, Dr. Naidu. Finally, last but not least, Dr. Naidu, I would like to, to thank you from the Institute from, for Global Dialogue and also from on behalf of the Mexican Embassy for your for your for your good uh, for for you uh, coordinating this this roundtable and to bring this uh, uh, this exercise to us as a as a very brilliant uh, scholar and, and with your knowledge of both countries both countries thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I, 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 I can see the, the presence of our colleagues from DIRCO and our colleagues from the Mexican Embassy. Uh, they are, I would like to, to say that they, they, they really work hard in order to make this, this a reality, the, the realization, the carrying out these, these roundtables. Thank you a lot. Professor uh, Dr. Prishani Naidu, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good afternoon and good morning, esteemed guests, colleagues, friends, Ambassador Sarah Valdez. And uh, I don't think Pilani is here yet, but also Susanna, thank you very, very much for organizing this and for inviting me into the discussion. I want to share my screen. I have a few slides. Um, So yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying thank you also because I'm being invited into what I think is a really, really important, uh, interesting uh, and necessary conversation. Um, and I, I think, you know, it's not just because of the 30 years of formal relations that we're celebrating, but I think it's also because this book um, and this chapter that we're looking at today take us back in history um, to think about the present uh, in relation both to differences that we've experienced over these long histories, but also to common problems um, and ways of thinking about solving these problems, experiences of trying to solve these problems um, in ways that are sometimes similar, sometimes different. But I think it's both through sharing about what's similar as well as the differences um, that allow such con conversations to be productive. I don't have a lot to say in these introductory remarks. Um, I'm going to try not to say what we expect the presenters to say, but what I'm going to do is just uh, 
put out a few very broad uh, concepts, questions, and issues that I have uh, gleaned from reading uh, the chapter. Uh, so I think, you know, the important question we're all asking, and the book asks and confronts in this chapter in a particular way, is why compare Mexico and South Africa? We're so far away from each other, um, and we don't speak the same language. That's something else that I think is really important in terms of these conversations, centering language, allowing translation and interpretation to make these conversations meaningful. Um, and I think the chapter, and I haven't had the chance to look at the entire book, um, but the uh, reasons behind what's put forward in terms of the reasons for this kind of comparative work, um, although the chapter fixes or, or, or takes us to a particular period, um, the period between 1994 and 2014, um, it also emphasizes the longer histories of colonialism and apartheid uh, in the two countries. Um, and in reflecting on the 30-year uh, formal collaboration, um, it also asks us to think the present in relation to these histories um, that um, uh, uh, are different in many ways, but also bring us to common uh, questions, problems, and issues. Um, I think it's also really important that the title of the book um, has in it transition. And the uh, chapter speaks about transition or transitions in terms of different moments. Um, in the uh, Mexican experience, the um, uh, 1970, um, is, is highlighted as well as um, the later uh, year of 1994. So it's the Mexican Revolution um, that is first um, highlighted in thinking change and in thinking change in terms of the question of inequality uh, that's at the center of this chapter. Um, and then the later period, 1994, which we think of in terms of South Africa as uh, the um, transition in terms of the first changes made in trying to change the effects of formal apartheid in South Africa, the uh, non-racial democratic elections for the first time. Um, and yet in that period, and uh, while the South African emphasis then is 1994 and the move to 1996 and the adoption um, of uh, a clearly neoliberal uh, set uh, of policies in, in the form of the growth, employment, and redistribution strategy. Um, the Mexican chapter also points to the uh, neoliberal turn in the form of the uh, uh, North American Free Trade Agreement. And I think that's the first kind of common that's pointed to in this chapter. Uh, the effects on transition on what needs to be transformed, on possibilities for change in terms of uh, the adoption of neoliberal policies. And I think this is also a, a significant uh, aspect of the book um, as we're, we're comparing global South powers. Um, often it is through uh, Northern inflections that we think the experiences of uh, the global South. And I think the importance of this book is in challenging that in, in very concrete ways. So to get to the heart of, of the chapter, which is inequality, um, I think uh, another really important part of the chapter or um, what the chapter points to is that we have to think inequality in terms of its relationship to questions of poverty as well as um, growth um, and development. Um, and I'm sure uh, the uh, presenters will speak in, in far more detail to these questions, but I think one of the important arguments made is that even though we sometimes see poverty being addressed in real ways, we see some changes in terms of poverty uh, being addressed, inequality continues. Um, and we need then to think more carefully about how poverty strategies include attention to questions of inequality. And then uh, in relation to growth and development, to not celebrate 
uh, economic growth in particular, and the standard indicators that might show development without thinking uh, how inequality might not have been affected in real terms uh, through them. So the chapter's significance is, is to, to go or take us through the traditional indicators, but to then argue for us to move beyond the traditional indicators of GDP, um, uh, Gini coefficient, and so on. While those tell us significant things, we also need to think beyond them. And I think the significance here, and I, I, I think it's really significant that this chapter is called Social and Territorial Inequality. And I think this is um, not done all the time. <laughs> so its importance is in centering the question of the territorial and its relationship to the social. And I think what the chapter does, does in doing this is to also point us to differences in both countries um, that uh, relate or produce particular forms of inequality and poverty through uh, control over territory. So in doing this, um, there are certain arguments that are shared uh, or certain perspectives that are shared across the chapter. Um, in particular, the, uh, the uh, attention given to multicultural nations or the commitment across both countries to producing and cultivating ways of ensuring multicultural nations. But there's some problematization of this um, in uh, the work that the chapter does to both show how policy interventions sometimes uh, might uh, uh, exclude certain issues related to territory um, that prevent the realization of, this, uh, of its broader ideas of multiculturalism. Um, there isn't a problematization of multiculturalism as a concept, but I think that uh, in showing the value and sometimes neglect of policy in working towards this, there is the emergence of some uh, kind of critique. There is also mention of the ways in which forms of resistance sometimes turn to cultural differences, ethnic differences, racial differences in trying to protect, in trying to protect what communities have or what individuals have against uh, policies that are trying to bring uh, people together across those differences. There's also a focus on questions of production in the chapter. Um, uh, the words used are capital and labor um, and how they relate to questions um, of growth and economic production. Um, and here there's a, there's a, a real uh, sense of challenge uh, across the book, across the two countries, um, in terms particularly of uh, how jobs, job creation, employment, unemployment are treated um, and uh, present possibilities for addressing questions of inequality um, and poverty. Um, in the Mexican case, the uh, discussion of a minimum wage is really um, significant and I think offers uh, another way of thinking about um, these questions related to job creation, employment, unemployment, work um, in different ways. Um, and then a related question um, of cash transfers or social grants. In the Mexican case, cash transfers. In the South African case, social grants. Um, spoken about in terms of the very uh, real problems that they might bring about, but also the possibilities that they open up, particularly in cases where job creation uh, is on the decline, like in South Africa, uh, where unemployment is rising, and where there are possibilities to think about work outside um, of the wage, outside of wage labor. Um, and I think this opens up a broader discussion uh, potentially about universal basic income being one of the factors that need to be considered uh, when talking about inequality um, and poverty. So the solutions, what are the solutions that the chapter presents? And I think this is an also 
uh, important uh, aspect and an area that can take us forward in terms of the conversation that follows. Um, and I think Im importantly, the chapter contributes by going back to the histories of territorial and social inequality um, and to ask how these can be centered in terms of economic, social and political change that is being uh, thought and produced in terms of policies. Um, and one of the questions that I think lurks across the chapter, but I think might be thought uh, more carefully in terms of the uh, information that is being shared, the conversation that exists, um, is how do we think uh, this kind of analysis, this centering of territorial and social inequality um, in terms of the relationships between the global, the national, and the local. And I think that then brings us back to the title of the book um, and the question of power and power that lies in the global south and in collaborations acro across global south uh, countries. So I'm going to leave it there. Um, and uh, I hope that we will be able to come back to some of these issues um, in the co conversation that follows. But I'm going to hand over uh, to our first speaker, Professor Umberto Gonzalez, who is one of the co-editors of the book. Thank you. Bueno, me... bueno, agradezco mucho la Thank you very much for the opportunity to participate in this event that addresses a central issue in the book and that we have the opportunity to discuss beyond the co-authors of the different chapters. I'm going to start by highlighting that the, in the conclusions, the colleague Dion and I, we thought it would be an important task, a difficult task to make a comparison that would contribute of 22 scholars in different areas of social sciences and environmental sciences that use different approaches and methodologies based on on extensive revision of historical documents, statistic docu statistical documents of each country. After a lot of thought, our proposal in the conclusion was according to the transdisciplinary methodology of the project as we considered it initially. We set aside the idea of a historical narrative, um, lineal narrative that would lead us to define parallel sequences of each country to identify causes and effects and to establish tendencies and features of South global South countries. We also uh, we didn't want to use uh, models of growth equilibrium that would facilitate to systematize the information of both countries to determine comparatively which country is more or less powerful, somehow violent or more or less violent, dynamic and well and rich. We took the idea of transition with a with an open meaning and not prescriptive that would allow that allowed us to and analyze the meaning and the transcendency of uh, international treaties, influx of products, people pro uh, of, for, of each country. But also, it allowed us to talk about synchronicities, dissonances, transformations, and stagnation in both countries. The, the geographical diversity, cultural and, and social in Mexico and South Africa was more important 
with an open terminology and we set aside homo homogenization, standardization or domination that are defined in studies about globalization from a perspective from uh, the global north. In this book, it was fundamental to contextualize historically and territorially the findings in each chapter and to analyze them from a phenomenological methodology. We had in our favor communication with each of the contributors in which we revised the documents, the chapters, we gave them recommendations so that they could take them in a very open way, three years from the beginning after the conclusion, two meetings, one in Guadalajara, Jalisco, and the other one in Johannesburg. In Johannesburg. After this reading and rereading, we identified four themes that were present in all the chapters, and we call them transversal subjects because they showed cultural, so, social, cultural, social, and economic transformations. The first was cutting point was Mexico and South Africa because they are mega diverse countries. The second one was the mega diversity, ling, the uh, mega diversity ling, uh, linguistic and racial in both countries because um, local and national policies portalize this mega diversity would have more possibilities of resilience in these two in these two countries and it would lead to ways of cooperating and in a constructive and harmonic way third transversal axis was the colonial past from a, um, a violent conquest by the imperial governments. Our analysis focused on the transition process of the last decades, but it was not possible to ignore the prints of this past and to consider this historical process of both powers of the global south in the last decades. And the last Axis was the process of construction of a national identity during the independence. This process has taken place after authoritarian governments. On the one side, sharp, unequal divisions in the territories and then also in an international environment that has been dominated militarily by the post-colonial northern countries and transnational countries that also wanted to expand their trade, getting basic products in from the independence um, and dominated um, countries. The construction of a nation in both countries and a national identity we identified processes of transition, authoritarian regimes, and this process has been accompanied by a program in the last decades that looks for growth and competitivity in the economy and a better influence in the territories with an importance in international forums. This transition process in both countries in which the mega, mega diversity has been compromised, it shows societies with a great vitality where the stakeholders and actors, they compete, I open quotations, to, con to build a new basis of society plural, guided by social justice and symmetric dialogue, inter intercultural and interracial dialogue. By close quotation, the first chapter of Dr. Plessier, 
Can de la Peña. In this process of transition is where I would like to locate the presentation of today, Mexico and South Africa, two powers of the Global South are in a group of societies that show a lot of poverty and inequality in the world. In both countries, the population below the threshold level of food sovereignty and services, it's still great, even as the same as what we had in the 90s that did not address the, the current situation still persists because the government of both countries have not managed to give a solution to poverty in an interior, integral uh, manner and taking this as a priority. Also, the competitivity and economic development cannot be combined, it's not combined with equity and sustainability of the resource of the natural resources. The problems of inequality and insecurity, they question the strategic, the economic strategies from these countries that project the, of what they project in international forums. Poverty and inequality are still present despite the law that, guarant that guarantees the protection of the population, which is a fundamental right for transition for a more egalitarian society and democratic. Equality and poverty is, are the great challenges that both countries face to build an identity and a society, a democratic society uh, with participation from everyone. Thank you very much. Gracias. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Humberto Gonzalez, for for your um, insight of uh, the background of the preparation of this fantastic project, which I don't think it's out, it will ever out be outdated because there will always be uh, situations where you know we could discuss further uh, all the topics that uh, you have included in the different chapters uh, of the book. Um, now Nayeli will um, assist me to uh, uh, upload a presentation um, in a PowerPoint uh, format of the chapter that was, uh, you know, compiled and co-authored by Dr. Miguel Santiago Reyes Hernandez, uh, who is the co-author of this chapter from Mexico. Um, I just like to um, indicate to our um, participants that uh, this is the entire, uh, this presentation is the entire chapter that was uh, written um, in as a, as a co-author and co-researcher with um, also another um, author from Mexico, uh, Professor Graciela Turiel. Um, and, and we are putting this presentation on its entirety, um, basically the 27 pages as it's shown in the book. Um, and we will also put this presentation on, on, on the chat room, Nayeli, we could copy this um, you know, presentation so for everybody to read. Um, in the absence of Dr. Um, Miguel Reyes uh, presenting himself or defending himself this chapter, uh, what we decided to do is just to basically present what it was written in the book as it was. Um, so just to give you an idea of what the, the research entailed, I'd just like to say that this research presents an analysis of the evolution and determinants of inequality in Mexico. It is a chronological and historical research between 1994 and 2014. So basically the book was finished 10 years ago. Similarly to the South African chapter, the Mexican case is organized into four sections. The layout, the four sections here that you will basically see on, on this PowerPoint presentation. 
the, the data used in most of the, of the graphs and charts uh, of which there are quite few and, uh, uh, and, and own um, estimations uh, came from the Mexican, uh, Mexico's National Institute of Statistics and also the geography INEGI for the Spanish acronym, that's basically the name of the, of the institute, particularly from, from the Households Income and Expenditure sur Survey. Now you will realize that also in South Africa, we have similar institutions that are able to provide a pretty accurate information. Nayeli, you can just go on a little bit further on the slide. Okay, stop, um, stop. Um, I like to point out that this uh, study made by the uh, Mexican professors is very much a historical, it has very much a historical perspective um, because that then starts in the year 1950 and goes to, to the year 2017. Um, and and I think that it's very important. Um, it's very important that uh, we realize that this is study has got this historical background as well as um, obviously discuss contemporary issues. Nayeli, go down. Okay, stop, stop. As you can see here, um, the study had actually covered the period of, um, you know, some stabilizing development periods that the professor uses are from 1950 to 1977. And this is very important to, to, to make a point on this because, you know, we, we have to also see the historical side of, of, of you know, the statistics and, and, and how the social and territorial inequality uh, in Mexico, you know, had developed. Um, thank you. Just go down, Ayeli. Thank you. Stop, stop, stop. Okay, thank you. Um, as in Mexico, um, you know, since uh, the, the, the late 1950s, um, the, there's been also many, many changes on the growth of population, on the development um, of of the population, uh, and and if we compare and we, you know, indicate uh, those statistics towards the inequality, we very much find that in Mexico, uh, the growth that happened, it it very much happened um, in in the main cities, uh, you know. So the division was between urban and rural areas. So th this is not a a study that can basically uh, give one figure fits all kind of situation because I seen very much in other Latin American countries, uh, you know, the development happened in, in, in the urban areas and, and, and the uh, rural areas were basically left uh, just as they were during pre-colonial, during colonial, nothing much has changed, had changed. So that is also a very important um, aspect to realize between growth and development and, and the connection to inequality. Nayeli, go on, thank you. Okay, stop here, stop, stop, yes. Um, there again, uh, this um, uh, statistics in figure one um, represents very much the income inequality in Mexico. Um, you know, obviously taking into consideration the Gini uh, coefficient and, and the total household income. And I think this is an index that many countries, uh, also South Africa takes into consideration, um, but I don't think one should take one index as, as, a, as a one indicator because there are, you know, uh, various, um, uh, in the indicators that you know can give you an idea of of the inequality in in in, in the global south 
or particularly in, in developing countries. Thank you. Stop, 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 stop. <laughs> uh, yes, here again, there is another graph that um, it's very much interested to see, and that is also um, showing the growth and inequality between the periods, the historical periods of 1984 and 2016. So very much this, I would consider a very interesting uh, graph because you could actually see from the years, you know, um, all, all, all the, 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 the growth and inequality that have happened in um, in Mexico. And I think this is also a, a, an example of Mexico as a, as a fantastic, great country with an enormous population. It would be also an indicator to other Latin American countries that have a little bit less population than Mexico, but uh, they, they have uh, you know growth uh, in similar uh, inequality um, aspects uh, in Latin America. Thank you. Okay, so why why do we mention territorial? Um, you know, because w why there is um, a mention of social a, a territorial inequality? Because as we said before, there is a, a, a difference between uh, what we call the the cities, you know, the urban areas, and and the the big difference between the rural areas. Thank you. Okay, stop, stop, stop there. Thank you, and the indigenous people. Um, I just like to mention um, this aspect of, of race and ethnicity are, are the two mainstream issues with uh, different um, meanings and contexts, and, and they cannot be understood without a historical process. Um, I just leave you an example, um, a, a little thought that um, in, in in our Latin America and, and also particularly in Mexico, uh, periods of time where growth occurred in the in the urban areas, um, very much the indigenous people were considered poor just because of their ethnicity and their race, and somehow because of their exclusion from the developing that was happening and, and, and the sharing of some resources uh, that people enjoyed in the big cities. Um, and, and, and this is maybe an aspect that could very much um, replicate or be comparative as a study with, with Africa or with South Africa, where different races might have disadvantages as far as the development uh, in, 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 in equality is concerned in different aspects. So I just like to mention this indigenous uh, populations or people as we call it in, in Latin America and the difficulties that they, they have uh, in the past and they still have to be part of the sharing of, of the growth and, 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 and the development in the country. Thank you. Yes, as you can see, the professors have used, uh, you know, different um, uh, sources of, of uh, statistics. Uh, they have also used the Coneval, um, and that uh, is, is up to you, to our, re, uh, to our participants, uh, to read, uh, you know, in more detail uh, this study. And then you could actually get a very good perspective of the various aspects that the authors have taken. Uh, they have taken gender, um, uh, in also in, in terms of the inequality, and there is a, quite a lot of study on this. They have also taken into consideration education. You know, how much does it differ, the education on the rural areas compared that in the urban areas? And, and that obviously creates the inequality. And I think that's also something that we are, are experiencing here in South Africa. Okay, here there's some more tables um, 
on, on the educational levels. Uh, this is also showing an, a comparative analysis, uh, you know, on, on, on the different um, respective uh, coefficients that they, they can actually extract um, from what are the real wages uh, by educational levels. Um, and these are other uh, more detailed statistics that the professors are giving uh, to give a different um, aspect. Now also health, according to the to the Mexican constitution, access to health services is mandatory, like also like uh, in other countries. But you know, obviously the, the expenditure on health um, in percentage of the GDP, um, it's, it's quite low. Um, according to you know or, or the other members of the OECD um, countries, um, and that is a, a, a quite an interesting um, indicator as well. Um, now, how much can we compare that with South Africa? I wouldn't have the figures, but uh, so that is also another indicator to take into consideration. Here is the is the table of the um, the current expenditure on healthcare um, by percentage to the GDP. Thank you, Nayeli. Thank you. But stop! 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 Say. Uh, so yeah, here is a, an, another graph um, presented, and this one, this graph explains the um, the minimum wages and the labor income, and 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 indicates the uh, correlation between the minimum wages and and the labor income, um, and that also as an index, um, and this goes um, goes to show that um, clearly that will also show. Um, you know, the result of inequality in, in a country. Thank you. Okay, I just like to emphasize on this. Um, according to the Mexican Constitution, uh, there is a very important point to 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 um, un, un, underscore here, and is that is that in the Constitution it says that equal work should receive equal pay in the labor market, without any kind of discrimination, ethnic, uh, either ethnic or based on social origins or gender. And um, only through following this path can effective access to all social rights guaranteed by the constitution is ensured. But that is what is in, on paper. But in reality, uh, like in developing countries in, in the global south, uh, this is far from the, from the reality because uh, the people in the rural areas or the farms or the mines especially the mines, we discussed this in our previous webinar, not necessarily get paid um, equal or equally uh, for the same work that they do. They don't get over, they get paid over time and all of this, they don't have uh, benefits and so forth. So this is also another aspect to take in con into consideration that although a constitution could be uh, saying one thing, but the reality could be uh, something something else. And at this point, I just like to um, be mindful of the time and I just like to put some summary points on this presentation. And my summary points would be that inequality is closely related to poverty, that just in few words. In South Africa, some experts indicate that inequality is closely related to unemployment. And I think South Africa has got, you know, great um, disparity and, and a big gap in the unemployment figures compared to what Latin America or Mexico has got. And South Africa has extreme high levels of unemployment and, and we are not uh, much doing 
a lot about it. The inequality focuses uh, focuses on variations in living standards across the entire population. And, and that is what we found uh, in this study uh, done about Mexico. The studies of inequality, particularly in developing countries, are important in that they highlight the close relationship between high levels of inequality and low economic growth. So where we find low economic growth, and that has happened in Latin America, Mexico, South Africa, et cetera, it's, it's, it's immediate that the other will also suffer. However, new evidence is showing that there are other dimensions of living standards that can have an impact in the relative position of different individuals or households as we, 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 main, we are mentioned in the statistics within the distribution of income. Therefore, resulting in varying degrees of living standards for different cross social and cultural population groups. This has played a major role in the emergency of social and territorial inequality studies and databases in the overall sustainable development discourse because that is also now become an issue. You know, how do we measure this? Anyway, um, I just like to um, emphasize again that this research presents an analysis of the evolution and determinants of inequality in Mexico between 1994 and 2014, as I mentioned before. Similarly to the South African chapter, the Mexican case is organized in those four sections that I mentioned, but I did not go on detail on each one. You you could actually you know um, you know get your copy and and go through it in more detail. Anyway, um, I will you know close uh, you know this presentation uh, 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 now, and um, I will uh, give uh, open the floor to questions and answers that we might have from, from our dear public. Thank you. Is there any questions that our moderator can um, you know, manage? Thank you. Can I, can I- Rishani, uh, the floor is yours. May I just ask, Susanna, are we not getting Professor Mokomane? Uh, she, she's not connected. Uh, we are waiting for her okay. to connect. Okay, so... Um, yeah, we can just, uh, while we are waiting for her to connect, we can just go to the questions and answers. Maybe okay. she's having some uh, connectivity difficulties. Okay. We I sent her again the, the link to connect. Um, okay, I'm going to the chat. Yes, I just go to the raised. chat and see am if I you able can to pick take, up. Am I able to take questions? Uh, yes, by... please. Yeah, you okay. can take also questions or, or reply to the ones in the chat room. Okay, Thierry um, Alban, you've raised your hand. Would you like to put your mic on and ask a question? Please? Yeah. Or comments are welcome too. Now, this, this is a direct question that I've been, I've, I've been waiting for a long time. Um, our national initiative has been involved in indigenous people um, in South Africa for a long time. And the question on territoriality is extremely important to us. And the question is very simple. In recent uh, times, we have seen uh, the question of the territoriality between um, United States and Mexico on about three big states, Arizona, California, Texas. And uh, I think uh, from the fact that there is a huge immigration that is going through these three states in order to provide immigration of the poor or the so-called poor in the United States. And the United States um, responding with very harsh um, political 
decisions where those three territories have been uh, taken by uh, the United States to Mexico. And uh, my question is, when are we start not starting as a global South to actually address those issues? And in South Africa, the issue is the same in terms of, for example, many, many parts of South Africa who contain uh, artifacts from the Khoisan, for example. In most of our mountains, you have rock art, but those lands are not in the custody of indigenous people. They are in the custody of the colonialists or whatever you call them. I mean, the uh, name is... So it is my question of territoriality. How do we solve of how in a global south, we are starting to put agendas where we can actually uh, peacefully, I'm not saying we need to have a war or something like this, not United States knows about war, but indigenous people, we know more about peace. So how do we address through um, colloq or whatever you call what we are doing now, the issue of territorialities, uh, you know, uh, uh, belonging to indigenous people, which now, are, like your text was saying, the indigenous people are the poorest, but they don't have territory because the territory has occupied or something. And we should put uh, this in an agenda that for us is very important in our organization. Thank you for that contribution. I'm not going to be able to answer every question myself. Uh, so what I'm going to do is just take a few questions, uh, note them, and then open up also for others who are able to comment or want to answer particular questions to come into the discussion. Um, I, I think you raise a really, really important question, um, Thierry, if I might call you that. Um, that stretches across the two countries um, and that takes forms in different ways. And I think the chapter, uh, particularly in terms of the discussion on Mexico, uh, looks at the relationship between the indigenous um, policies related to indigenous communities in relation to the questions of um, inequality, in particular in socioeconomic terms, but also helping us historically uh, to look at why territory um, is so important. And I think in terms of your question, uh, perhaps what we need to do more in our work um, in our different spheres is to center uh, the question um, of territory. And I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna say any more now, but I'm hoping others could speak to um, ways of thinking territory, because I think there is also amongst indigenous communities um, and political struggles in Mexico, a very different theorization of territory and a very different relationship to land, to ownership, uh, to custodianship um, that are overlooked in uh, the, the existing or the prevailing or the, the dominant uh, policy interventions. Um, and particularly for those of us who sit in spaces uh, of knowledge production, I think it's really important and has become increasingly important to open up for alter alternative knowledge systems to contribute to these discussions. So I'm not offering any direct policy intervention possibility, but I hope I'm opening up the conversation to other ways of engaging with this. Um, Prishani, perhaps uh, we yes. could ask Professor Umberto Gonzalez on the yes. Mexican side if he yes. could um, at any point want to, you know, answer if he's got the, you know, the, 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 the you know, the, 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 the answer for that bueno, question. Me gustaría añadir dos elementos que I would son like to add two key points that are fundamental to take into account differences between Mexico and South Africa. Uh, the first one is the Mexican Revolution from 1910 to 1917 or 1920. During the revolution, there were significant changes in Mexico, but also it was a, a very cruel revolution because 10% of the population, of the Mexican population at that time died. 
dentro de los cambios importantes que um, hay, among the changes is that are that are related with the ownership of, of the land and this characterizes this is an important situation in Mexico because more than half of the Mexican territory was redistributed. We can point out that it was not always positive, but in general, we can say that it answered the social demand, a uh, social movement, a national social movement that advocated that the wealth that was um, in the in the land and that the, the originary population was dispossessed would go back to the to the small productors. Uh, this is an important element that we have to consider. Uh, the second one that I would like to to point out is that there is a difference between Mexico and South Africa. Is the uh, connection, interdependency, and closeness with Mexico between Mexico and the USA? The challenge that we have Mexico is not to be absorbed and dominated completely by the economic policy and military policy of the United States. In the history of Mexico, Mexico lost more than half of its territory in the 19th century, and it was added to the United States. This historical element has left a footprint, an important footprint in Mexico, but it has also been an important manner to look for interdependency and and policies that do not leave aside the sovereignty in Mexico. This should be considered, at least in the case of Mexico, the interrelation and interdependency with the United States is a reality that increases, especially after the neoliberal policies administered after 1990, 1990, 1984, until until now. Um, however, nowadays we have a president that uh, that really follows these uh, policies. This challenge is dominado completamente sino buscar resquicios. This challenge is to to look for spaces of opportunities for sovereignty. It's something that the government in Mexico has to has to face <clears throat> and i wanted to highlight this just to to make the the difference between both nations it's anyone wants to say anything else it, it, it's it's welcome of course gracias professor thank you very much professor umberto thank you thank you professor questions maybe that you can pick up from the chat room yes um dr alex Ricero is asking at what stage do we locate all forms of global inequality to global imperial designs um i think i'll throw that out uh to everyone um and come back to speak about it at the end um and then there's a more specific question about a universal basic income or phrased here as universal finance income. What is the solution regarding universal finance income? And then a comment that comes back to the question of territorial inequality, marginalized territories is a difficult inequality. So these are really big questions. Um, should we open up on the question of universal basic income or universal finance income? I think here, yeah, if I can just share my own thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. 
if we're thinking about particularly South Africa um, and a context of very high unemployment, um, we have a majority of our youth population sitting without jobs, um, and the uh, possibility of creating jobs is becoming increasingly uh, less. Um, also, the increase of part-time, casual, um, flexibilized employment is more and more the norm. Um, and in some of the communities in which I have worked, particularly informal settlements, there have been many attempts, particularly by women um, and unemployed uh, 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 people, uh, trying to make a living outside of the wage, coming together to perform forms of work, which we might not think about in traditional terms, um, collective uh, performance of duties of reproduction, for example, in the form of creches, uh, planting food gardens that provide for um, a larger number of a community beyond a family uh, to survive. Um, performing tasks that allow for survival and that often allow for life beyond survival. Um, and I think in that context, the um, generation of struggles around and for a basic income grant have uh, directed themselves towards those problems, but also the empowerment um, of uh, people coming together in collectives uh, to make life outside of the wage. And I think uh, struggles for basic income grant, um, we saw rise particularly in the context of the COVID pandemic, uh, making much clearer these uh, issues, problems and demands. Um, and the possibility for uh, basic income grant, I think particularly in the South African context, um, uh, is being pushed by movements organizing around the issue um, and struggles for basic income grant, I think, um, are what lie uh, 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 in the realm or, or make it possible uh, for the realization or at least some kind of a response uh, to growing unemployment. Um, I'm not sure if someone who knows the Mexican situation, uh, perhaps again, uh, Professor Gonzalez, uh, to speak about um, uh, the possibilities in Mexico. There have been some interventions in the chapter. Uh, there is some discussion um, about uh, uh, tra uh, cash transfers that come with um, required uh, changes in the forms of behavior of individuals or families um, and so on. We have other experiences in Latin America also, uh, Brazil, for example, um, but I'm not sure if there's anyone else who would like to come in on this question and discussion. See, there's lots in the chat now. Professor Gonzalez, puede añadir algo sobre ese, ese punto que mencionó eh, Professor Prichani? Professor Gonzalez, would you like to add something about eh, what mentioned what Prichani mentioned? This is a, a very a very wide eh, topic, but I think that there there would be some 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 chapters of the book or some areas of the book that might might be able to 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 answer part of this of this question uh, i would like to just point out that in, in the from the side of uh, migration uh, there have been always uh, uh, a relation of migration in, in, from mexico to the united states from from uh, from the 19th century and before it was a temporary migration but uh, because of the due to the conditions and to the conditions in the United States, this has been a, a migration for a very long time. It, 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 we, we should consider that in the Second World War, there was a, a program in the U.S. that was called the Programa Bracero, where Mexico was sending uh, workers to the United States, legal workers, 
in, in order to work because the, the United States were fighting the war and, uh, and they, they needed some uh, workforce. So they were, they were fighting in Europe or in Asia and, and, and they needed the workforce. So there has always been like a, this kind of relations, a relationship between Mexico and the United States. So uh, we can maybe talk to nowadays about uh, maybe 10 to 20, 10 to 12,000 uh, million, no, 12 million, sorry, uh, uh, illegal immigrants in, in the, the U.S. without any, without legal documents, but it's still like a very, a very large population, Mexican population living in the U.S. almost permanently. And Mexico is the, the, the second country uh, worldwide that receives the, the most uh, remittances from, from, from a foreign country. And this, these remittances come to, to, to urban areas and to rural areas. So migration is a, an economic alternative in Mexico. It has a very important part. It is a very important part of the, of the economy. And the, the Mexican population in urban in urban areas are mainly 80% 80, 80 of the population in Mexico is living in in urban areas, not in rural areas. So, and and migration migration is happening from both uh, from both areas. So there is an inter interdependence between the two countries, and and so we need to consider that it is a very complex uh, subject migration because Mexico is not just a, a country that that sends migrants to the US it's also a transit country it's also a transit con country in terms of migration because there is lots of people going into transit to, to Mexico coming from South America or Central America or from even other countries in the world and they are trying to to cross through Mexico to go to the border to, to go to the United States but Mexico doesn't have a, a, a right the a good policy or doesn't have a policy to 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 deal with with this transit so there have been very very big problems very important problems and catastrophic problems because of this lack of, of policy but but this is just one of the complexities of this of this uh, relationship the migration relationship of mexico and we can compare it to south africa because we can see that South Africa is also a, a country who receives immigration uh, from 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 some of the neighboring countries or from the neighboring countries, and they need to they, they need they need policies as well to, to deal with it. We should be thinking about how what is the demographic demographic impact of this of this situation. There is a, a chapter in the book. Uh, uh, the, the second chapter is is about demography. And we can see there that there is the distribution of population in the last decades in Mexico and in South Africa. And what are the, the characteristics and the economic, social and racial uh, 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 characteristics of this, of this dynamic? So I think that in chapter two, we, we might look for some of the answers that, that we are considering right now. Uh, maybe we can see, we can even see in this same chapter some some numbers, figures, and fluxes of the immigration, for example, from Mexico to the U.S., but at the same time, the, the flux of remittances from the U.S. to Mexico, and and how some, some, some areas of Mexico, some regions of Mexico, are, are completely dependent of this kind of the remittances and this this economic um, phenomenon. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gonzalez. Uh, uh, we are trying to connect with Professor uh, Zita uh, uh, that is having difficulties to 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 connect. Uh, Professor Zita Mokomane, uh, can we try to see if she is uh, back in our? Um, uh, if if she is back connected, Nayeli, can you actually see if she's back uh, connected? No, I'm afraid she's not. She was for uh, for a few minutes, uh, for a few seconds, but she's not now. And she's she's not um, back in there. All right, let's continue with our questions and answers. Uh, Pro Professor Naidu, can you perhaps pick up one more question? Um, I did see a hand up, but it's gone. Yes. 
Um, if the person who had your hand up would like to speak, please just raise it again. Um, but yes, make no... sure it's yes, make sure it's not a long, uh, just a question. That's not a you know a a, a long um, proposal. Okay, but let me just read a comment from the chat. It says, my comment would be that academics usually inform us that there is always a paradigm change in a country due to politics and the political awareness, education, gender inequality, etc. The redistribution of the land wealth plays an important role in dealing with these issues. So I think, you know, if we can also think that bigger question that was raised uh, earlier, um about whether we can uh, always attribute problems or only attribute problems to a larger imperial design um to also this uh comment um and i think prompt to think in more local terms or in more um in in, in terms that speak to issues that lie outside of those big uh, paradigm shifts that that we tend to focus on. Um, I see a hand raised, um, it's no name, Africa International Ministries. Good day. My name is um, Louise Olwagen. And um, thank you for accommodating me with all the questions in the chat area <laughs> regarding you know, land issues and immigration, illegal occupation in South Africa. Um, sometimes it's illegal and then we have our legal immigrants, but we have too many in the country. Then the define, defining imperialism sounds so EU and UK, but we have to look at designing a format for Mexico, specifically, with all the inequality they have, as well as South Africa. My question would be to the panel, and um, it's an imperative one. If we say that um, we, we in South Africa have gender, gender inequality, and our Polit political stance in our country is a problem regarding redistribution of land, wealth, and wealth. We need to define that very, very with a systematic approach, specifically when we look at defining um, imperialism. Thank you. So my question would be, how would we what is the way forward for the South and Mexico regarding this? Thank you for the, for allowing me to speak. Thanks, please. Um, can I just add a question from the chat? Uh, it's Thierry Alban again. One of the questions in, it, in relation to indigenous people is the appropriation of the corn species by the foreign corporates in both countries. So I think you know what we're doing here is also just isolating certain questions that relate to the bigger discussion uh, of social and territorial inequality. Um, and again, let me say I don't think we're going to find all the answers or be able to give all the answers today. But I think um, I'd like to just, in terms of the chapter that's being discussed, um, and perhaps Professor Gonzalez can come in here again, um, is to emphasize how um, a treatment of inequality um, as territorial inequality and bringing together territory with social, thus social and social consequences might help us to shift um, our approaches to policy formulation or to other forms of intervention um, in these questions. So with the question of land, for example, um, how do we uh, allow for a different way of speaking about questions of relationships to land? Uh, how might that uh, happen? How might that assist us um, in thinking in relation to the existing policies? Um, 
the question of corn, the question of the appropriation um, of forms of living, forms, uh, ways of being, I think is something else that might be thought through this frame. Um, Professor Gonzalez, would you like to come in or should I take one more question before you come in? I think take one more question. Okay, so there, there's a hand up. Uh, oh, uh, it's Ambassador. No, no, who is this? Sorry. Uh, Elia Sosa. Sorry. I Thank you. Thanks. Muy buenas tardes. Creo que. Hello, everyone. I think that one of the uh, two characteristics that are relevant and that differentiate uh, both countries is the, the territory itself, the characteristics of the territory, in the case of Mexico, and especially where the indigenous people live. The, it's a territory Mm -hmm. in, in, with a range of mountains that make the geography um, unique. The proximity between these um, groups of indigenous people in relation to the urban settlements. In the case of South Africa, the territory is not the same. And another important aspect that makes a distinction, the evolution of both countries has to do with the use of the land. In the case of Mexico, there is a, a very strong tradition in terms of agricultural processes. Um, I don't think it's it's the same in, in South Africa. And this... Uh, makes um, different types of struggles uh, for the indigenous people in Mexico, uh, the way it is nowadays. More than indigenous people, the way it is defined in international treaties uh, from the NATO, for example, the historical process it's not really considered like like a population with a with um with ownership in terms of territory the way it would be established but it's more communities with different developments and with the ownership with the ownership of of land according to the to the Mexican constitution I think that there is a an agricultural production in the case of Mexico. And I would like very much if the participants, the experts in South Africa could give us more information in this regard, because this is one of the experiences that has not been very positive in the case of the South African government to redistribute the land. And when they have done it, there hasn't been uh, the, the knowledge to exploit the land, and this is a, a main difficulty in the case of South Africa. Um, in the case of Mexico, our indigenous culture spins around the agricultural development, I believe. Professor Humberto González, yes, I agree with what Elia Sosa mentions about Mexico. Um, I would like to, to add this comment by saying that there are chapters in this book that address in a very specific manner uh, several of the issues that she addresses um, on top of what was mentioned about uh, demography, there is a chapter, a specific chapter that talks about food sovereignty. I think it's chapter seven in which we compare the, the 
processes of change in Mexico and South Africa. And we can see how la gran empresa agrícola agroindustrial the agricultural enterprise has taken is is relevant in both countries especially in South Africa more than in Mexico because there is a a gap a difference a difference with the ownership of land there was a a, um, an important agricultural reform in Mexico. And although there is another movement um, to dispossess indigenous population, but it has not been successful uh, from the government in the 90s, particularly from the 90s. But there is a chapter in which um, it is addressed the food sovereignty is addressed, and um, the chapter also talks about the, the land issue. There is another chapter that points out the relationship, the, the difficult relationship between South Africa with other countries and Mexico with other countries, but particularly with the United States. And this is uh, chapter number 10, and in which um, we analyze or the authors analyze the international treaties um, from the Second World War. Uh, they address the issue of Brexit and also other treaties that uh, before there is also there are also answers that could open questions what i can see from our work is a book that just open open questions and we clearly state that in the introduction more than to offer answers it really it really aims to generate questions that would allow us to understand very complex processes and not to understand them from the North perspective, but from the perspective of uh, the countries from the global South, where we cannot say that we have been successful in, in like, uh, countries like Mexico and South Africa, despite the economic growth or the place they occupy in the global economy. I think we are still countries that are very unique and in the understanding of our territories, uh, the understanding of our particular issues is where we can find solutions. And I think that also, uh, we also have to um, make a nuanced discourse so that it allows us to see emergent, emergent solutions in which the originary population, uh, poverty and marginalized uh, population has solutions and they have an effect in the construction of the nation. I think we have to come out from this, this uh, homogenization discourse that tries to homogenize um, and it's more complex than this. Uh, there are forces that are being developed that take our countries in different paths that are not only the governments, the of, and transnational companies that determine all the agenda. We have to be able to see what is being born. I liked what uh, our colleague uh, Prishari Naidu mentioned, where she said that there is the emergency of local societies, uh, multiple local societies that are determining a um, different way of using resources address to uh, food sovereignty and more healthy and uh, the conservation of the territory in terms of environmental aspects with um, international corporations that our governments allow. So this is my comment. There is another point that I would like that we haven't discussed and which is a specific chapter in the book that 
and it's about uh, violence and criminality, which characterizes our countries. And I think that we, there is a lot to learn and whatever characterizes us countries, but also uh, makes us different from other countries, I would invite you to read this chapter. Uh, maybe it would be it could be the next one, um, another opportunity for us to get together and talk about territories that are were considered very distant and different and were not studied in a comparative manner. Uh, thank you. Thank Professor you. Prashani Naidu, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, we are ready to hear your summary of this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Well, I think to start by saying thank you very much to Professor Gonzalez for stepping in at the last minute uh, and for all of you uh, who have contributed and stayed in the discussion. Um, but I think I want to uh, emphasize something that's come up in the last uh, few comments, um, and that is the importance of asking questions um, and the fact that comparative research, um, and we are also doing, uh, we are also undertaking comparativist research um, at the Institute and at uh, SWAP, the Society Work and Politics Institute. Uh, we're working with different groups uh, in Mexico, uh, but we're also finding that our work is mostly important in generating common questions or questions that might sometimes be differently uh, posed or encountered in our experiences, uh, but that allow us to produce new knowledge uh, through confronting them. Um, and I hope I can take the liberty of quoting from uh, a movement in Mexico, the Zapatistas who struggle over land. Um, and one of their slogans that has uh, been important to us here is walking, we ask questions. So we don't always have the answers. Our research and approaches to knowledge production are not always directed at uh, finding the right answers, uh, but finding the right questions or shaping questions amongst ourselves in struggle about issues we're confronting that we might not also understand it all of their uh, depth um, and density, but coming together to formulate questions that will allow us to produce alternatives um, that take us further in terms of our struggles. And more importantly, I think also in shaping community and communities of knowledge production for us. Um, so I'm not going to be able to give answers uh, from our conversation today. Um, I'm really sorry uh, that I couldn't just fill in uh, for uh, 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 Professor Mokumane um, and share more about the South African experience. But I think nevertheless, our conversation uh, has shown the importance of thinking territory, um, thinking inequality in terms of the frame of territorial and social, uh, um, in terms of that frame of territory and the social. Um, and I hope that we will be able to um, shape conversations going forward um, that I think might also allow us to move between the very different levels and layers that have presented, presented themselves in this discussion. So, I mean, we the last set of comments looking at the very local, um, you know, what hasn't really featured in these discussions is the kind of developments at municipal level, at borough level, um, at city level. Um, but I think the broad frame can still be used uh, to um, interact and engage um, at that level too. Um, so thank you, um, everyone. Um, I think uh, just finally to also say that the kind of comparative method that uh, Professor Gonzalez outlined in more detail I think is one that should um, be uh, engaged with uh, more closely um, and that that kind of comparative approach would also allow us to think questions of land, think questions um, 
of ownership, think uh, questions um, of how we relate ourselves to each other and to uh, the kind of um, uh, territories that we inhabit um, might also uh, shift in that way. So yes, no conclusive uh, presentation and summary at the end, but I think importantly opening up this discussion to further work. So thank you very much again. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Susanna. Thank you, Professor Prishani Naidu. Uh, very much uh, appreciated all your comments and all your professionalism. Um, it has certainly been a very informative webinar and the information shared uh, by our main speakers uh, proves to be valuable. Um, as Professor Prashani said, you know, we are um, opening, um, you know, to more questions. You know, we are not giving solutions, uh, but we are basically opening um, a, a debate. And these comparative studies that have been done chapter by chapter in, in the book, um, it, it shows, like I said before, uh, that it's, it's not um, a, a closed subject. It's actually subjects that are being open uh, all the time, either in Mexico or in South Africa. Um, that, that I think uh, are all the subjects and also the updates that we are uh, um, trying to do by doing this series of webinars uh, is also very important. Uh, since the book was written a written few years ago, I think it's now almost 10 years ago. But I find that um, the discussions and the studies and the research done in the book are absolutely still valid and they're still uh, updated. So I encourage uh, our, um, uh, uh, our public and our audience uh, to try to get hold of the book um, if they need any information, you know, where to buy the book, uh, they can send us, um, they can contact us as, at IGD at the Institute of Global Dialogue, and we will give you the coordinates and, you know, where you could buy the book on, online. Um, that's um, obviously, um, you know, um, some of the details were also shared uh, at the, when you have received the invitation. Um, the, there are some pictures of the book uh, the one that is in English and the one that is in Spanish. So if you prefer to get the book in Spanish or in English, it's, you know, it's up to you, but all the details have been shared. But if you still need any further information, we will be very glad uh, to give it to you. And then as a closing uh, little remark that I'd like to do is a quote from Mandela. And, uh, you know, he was very well known by his, you know, quotes on, on different subjects. And I quote uh, Mandela, as long as poverty, injustice, and gross inequality persists in our world, none of us can truly rest. I close quotes. The, the, the way forward, as from the point of view of the Institute of Global Dialogue, and I'm sure that the, the Embassy of Mexico, who partner with us in this project, can agree. The Institute for Global Dialogue, in partnership with the Embassy of Mexico, are supporting the series of four webinars, which were programmed for 2024. And we are, as you know, this is the third webinar and we've got one more to go. In relation to other chapters of the book, Global South Powers in Transition, a comparative analysis of Mexico and South Africa. And with that, I thank you all for joining us today. And I declare this webinar closed. Thank you. <laughs>